The War in Heaven. The origin of the conflict. How can a war occur in heaven? Isn't it a place of peace and harmony? How did it all start? This battle was between Lucifer and the heavenly host. God created the angels, powerful beings of glory, who served him faithfully. Job chapter 38, verses 4 through 7. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you know and have understanding, who determined the measurement of the earth? If you know, or who stretched the measuring line on it? On what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God, angels, shouted for joy. This passage portrays the angels as witnesses to the creation of the earth, rejoicing in God's creative work. It suggests that angels were created to praise and glorify God, highlighting their role in worship and adoration. Angels are also described as powerful beings who carry out God's commands. Psalm chapter 103 verses 20 through 21 says, Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. This passage emphasizes the obedience and servitude of angels, indicating that they are dedicated to fulfilling God's will. They are portrayed as mighty beings who execute God's commands with precision and obedience. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, angels are described as ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. This verse highlights the role of angels as servants of God, sent to aid and assist believers in their journey of faith. One of these angels, Lucifer, was particularly magnificent, adorned with beauty and wisdom. However, pride crept into Lucifer's heart. He desired to exalt himself above God. Lucifer's rebellion was not only against God, but also against his established order. He sought to overthrow God's authority and take his place. In Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 15, we gain insight into Lucifer's exalted position and his subsequent downfall. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, carnelian, chrysolite, an emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. These verses depict Lucifer as a being of unparalleled beauty and wisdom, created by God to serve as a guardian cherub in the heavenly realms. He dwelt in the presence of God, surrounded by splendor and majesty, yet his heart became corrupted by pride. Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 through 15 provides further insight into Lucifer's fall. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Lucifer's rebellion was rooted in his desire to exalt himself above God, to be equal with the Most High. His pride led him to covet God's throne and seek to establish his own kingdom, apart from God's authority. This act of rebellion resulted in his expulsion from heaven and his transformation into Satan, the adversary. The story of Lucifer's rebellion serves as a warning against the dangers of pride and the folly of seeking to exalt oneself above God. It reminds us that true greatness comes from humility and obedience to God's will. Lucifer's fall from grace stands as a testament to the destructive power of sin and the importance of remaining steadfast in our faith and devotion to God. Lucifer's Fall Lucifer's fall from grace is a cautionary tale that highlights the destructive nature of pride and rebellion against God. His story serves as a reminder of the consequences of straying from God's will in seeking to exalt oneself above him. 
This passage reveals Lucifer's prideful desires to exalt himself above God and establish his own kingdom. He sought to usurp God's authority and take his rightful place, but his rebellion led to his downfall and expulsion from heaven. Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 17 further describes the reason for Lucifer's fall. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. Lucifer's beauty and wisdom were corrupted by his pride, leading to his ultimate downfall. His story serves as a warning against the dangers of vanity and self-centeredness, reminding us of the importance of humility and obedience to God. The consequences of Lucifer's fall were severe. He was cast out of heaven and became known as Satan, the adversary. Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 describes his fate. The great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Lucifer's fall serves as a reminder that pride is a dangerous and destructive force that can lead to spiritual ruin. It teaches us the importance of humility and obedience to God's will, reminding us to always seek His glory above our own. Pride and Ambition Pride and ambition are common traits that, when unchecked, can lead to destructive behavior and spiritual downfall. The Bible provides several cautionary tales and teachings on the dangers of pride and ambition, urging us to cultivate humility and contentment instead. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 warns, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. This verse highlights the correlation between pride and downfall, emphasizing the importance of humility in avoiding such a fate. Cast out of heaven. The biblical account of Lucifer's rebellion and subsequent expulsion from heaven serves as a powerful reminder of the consequences of disobedience and pride. Lucifer, once a beautiful and powerful angel, was cast out of heaven due to his desire to exalt himself above God. Revelation chapter 12 verses 7 through 9 further describes the conflict in heaven and Lucifer's expulsion. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Isaiah 14 verses 12 through 15 describes Lucifer's fall from grace. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. This passage illustrates Lucifer's prideful ambitions and his desire to exalt himself above God. His rebellion led to his expulsion from heaven and his transformation into Satan, the adversary. This passage portrays the epic battle between good and evil, culminating in Satan and his followers being cast out of heaven. The story of Lucifer's fall from grace serves as a reminder that disobedience and rebellion against God's will have severe consequences. It teaches us the importance of humility and obedience, urging us to learn from Lucifer's mistakes and remain faithful to God's commands. Let us heed this warning and strive to live lives that honor and glorify God in all we do. This is, was, a battle between good angels and angels that are now referred to as fallen angels. Fallen angels are spiritual beings who rebelled against God. They now serve Satan, the prince of darkness, and seek to oppose God's will and lead humanity astray. These beings have been depicted in films, television shows, and popular literature. Many ask, do fallen angels only exist in the domain of fiction? Is there something more real about these ominous creatures? Yes, they exist and may have a greater impact on our lives than we could realize or contemplate in our daily lives. However, not everything we hear about them in popular culture is accurate. Michael faces the dragon and his fallen angels. For any team to win, there must be a contest. 
Revelation 12 describes the ultimate battle between good and evil. The hosts of heaven take on the dragon and his angels. Does good eventually win? And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they did not prevail, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 8. War broke out in heaven. While Satan is likely headed to hell, he is not presently there. It's common to see cartoons depicting Satan in a red outfit with a pitchfork and pointed tail, but such medieval folklore is hardly faithful to the biblical picture. In Job 1, Satan is mentioned as having access to heaven and visiting God's presence there. This brings us to Revelation 12, where the devil and his imps march on heaven, creating a cosmic spiritual conflict. As the dragon fought, he did not prevail. The Archangel Michael was God's champion and commanding general of God's forces. We read, Michael and his angels. The most well-known angelic being in the Bible is probably Michael, along with Gabriel. What exactly does Michael's role as an archangel entail? In what capacity does he fit into God's heavenly host? What has he accomplished, and what are his duties? Michael, that name begs the question, who is comparable to God? Many parents who name their sons Michael have no idea what the name means. Michael is introduced to us by the prophet Daniel. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. This is a dramatic scene of a battle between good angels and evil angels, faithful angels and fallen angels. Who fights in this battle? Satan represents the dragon, and Satan is not God's counterpart. God has no peer. Michael, the chief angel opposing this chief of fallen angels. Why is the battle fought? In a previous scene of conflict between Michael and Satan, Jude 9, Satan had faced Michael. Here is another occasion where Satan wants to get in the way of God's plan for the end times. Based on Daniel, Jewish people recognized Michael as their guardian prince, who would defend them from the angels of the other nations who sought to oppress them. Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was standing in the way for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Michael could single-handedly ward off angels of other nations. Michael's power, however, had limits. He could not overstep his authority, and hence could not act against Satan himself without the permission of God's. Jude 9. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him an abusive judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Here, however, Michael and his forces cast down Satan's forces, symbolizing Christ's earthly victory in heaven. When is this battle fought? This battle happens at the midpoint of the seven years, as described by Daniel. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Now at that time Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. How is this battle fought? We know this is a real fight, but is it a material or spiritual battle? Our battle with Satan and his demons is spiritual, fought on the battleground of truth and deception, of fear and faith. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Regarding material attacks against the believer, Satan and his demons were disarmed at the cross. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. In his classic work, Paradise Lost, the great poet Milton imagined this battle. Michael bids sound, the archangel trumpet, through the vast of heaven. It sounded, and the faithful armies run. Hosanna to the highest, nor stood at gaze. The adverse legions, nor less hideous joined. The horrid shock, now storming fury rose. And clamor such as heard in heaven till now, 
was never. Arms on armor clashing braid, horrible discord, and the matting wheels. Of brazen chariots raged, dire was the noise of conflict. Overhead, the dismal hiss of fiery darts and flaming volleys flew, and flying vaulted either host with fire. So under fiery cope together rushed, both battles main with ruinous assault and an inextinguishable rage, all heaven resounded, and had earth been then, all earth had to her center shook. Revelation chapter 12 verse 9. Immediately following Satan's defeat and prior to his war against the church, a loud voice in heaven proclaims God and his people's victory over Satan the accuser. In verse 9, the dragon is identified as Satan, but in verse 10, he is described as the accuser who brings charges against God's people. Satan refers to his identity, but accuser refers to his role in God's war against his people. Since believers triumphed over Satan, they're confident of victory even though Satan continually accuses them. Their victory over Satan was based on three factors. The blood of the Lamb, their faithful testimony to Jesus, their faithfulness to Christ. A faithful testimony to Christ brings them victory in the spiritual war. We read, So the great dragon was cast out. Throughout this verse, our spiritual enemy is referred to as dragon, the serpent of old, devil, Satan, and the one who deceives the whole world. These titles describe Satan as vicious, an accuser, an adversary, and a deceiver. We read, he was cast to the earth. The Bible describes various falls of Satan, and Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 describes the second of these four falls. He fell from glorified to profane. Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 14 through 15. You are the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You are on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. Satan went from having access to heaven to restriction to the earth. 1 Kings chapter 22 verse 21. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. Satan also went from the earth to bondage in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 through 2. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he took hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. We read, his angels were cast out with him. This implies that demonic spirits are fallen angels who allied with Satan in his rebellion against God. These are his angels. These angels are also the same as the third of the stars of heaven described in Revelation chapter 12 verse 4. Revelation chapter 12 verse 4. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and hurled them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. It's comforting to know that faithful angels outnumber fallen angels two to one since Satan only drew a third of the stars of heaven. A joyful declaration in heaven. Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 through 12. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you with great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. We read, the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. Satan's accusing work ends here, when he is cast out from his access to heaven. That is why today we need an intercessor and advocate. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. Therefore, he is also able to save forever those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. This tells us three keys to the saints' victory over Satan. 
Satan may have deceived even himself into thinking that he has a chance. Our rebellion against God makes even less sense than Satan's rebellion does. The heavens can rejoice over the dragon's departure, and it is bad news for the earth and the sea. The devil knows his time is short, and he is determined to pour out his wrath as widely as possible. The dragon's spleen is vented especially against Israel, the nation from which the Messiah came. John then offers a simple strategy for believers to overcome Satan's attacks, a threefold plan against the devil's assaults, covering, confession, and courage. Christians who think spiritual warfare is an excellent subject to debate, but don't think it impacts their lives daily, may be vulnerable to spiritual defeat. Good soldiers of Jesus Christ know Satan roams the earth seeking those whom he may devour. We must be ready. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The primary way Satan attacks the people of God is through blasphemy, and he is the accuser of our brethren. Even so, believers have a divine advocate before God named Jesus. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Satan the adversary may seek to destroy God's people, but Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. There are many lessons here. The truth First, victory only comes with a fight. Every crown comes at a cost. There is no success without sacrifice. The good news is anything worth achieving is worth the fight. Michael didn't fight alone, and the saints didn't defeat the enemy alone. Victory rarely comes without teamwork. God designed us to win in community. A victory should always be celebrated. The heavens rejoice when the Lamb wins. The greater the victory, the greater the celebration. Jesus confirms this. In Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. This statement was made in response to the return of the 70, or 72 disciples that Jesus had sent to evangelize and prepare his way to Jerusalem. According to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus had given these disciples specific instructions. Now after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. Picture this. After completing their mission, a group of 70 people return with a report. As they share their findings, their faces light up with joy and a hint of surprise. Can you imagine what exciting news they might have brought back? Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 18. Now the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. This was a good day. It was a productive day for the disciples of Jesus despite the confusion and hardship they faced. They were able to spread the message of hope and love to those who needed it the most, and their efforts were met with success. All 70 returned. Not one of the lambs had been eaten by the wolves. We read, Even the demons are subject to us in your name. In Luke chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus gave instructions to 70 disciples he had sent out to preach the gospel. Unlike the 12 disciples whom he had earlier commissioned in Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 2, to cast out demons, Jesus had not given such explicit instructions to the 70. However, as they went about their ministry, they discovered that they, too, had the power to cast out demons. This unexpected blessing of their ministry was a reminder that when we step out in faith and boldly do what Jesus tells us to do, we can anticipate that He will bless us in ways beyond our expectations. It is a testimony to the power of obedience and the faithfulness of God to those who trust in Him. Luke chapter 10, verse 9 says, And heal those in it who are sick, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. This remarkable achievement prompted Jesus to speak of the fall of Satan, which was a reference to the moment when Satan rebelled against God and was consequently kicked out from heaven. This event is considered a significant judgment upon Satan, marking his downfall and ultimate defeat. 
Jesus' reference to Satan's fall as quick and dramatic as lightning from heaven emphasizes the suddenness and finality of the judgment. If Satan can be cast down, how much more are the demons under him? This is a reference to the judgment on Satan when he rebelled against God and was kicked out of heaven. In fact, there are four falls of Satan, and this passage refers to his final fourth fall. This is the only fall of Satan that has already happened. We read, Son of the Morning. This title, which embodies splendor, beauty, and honor, was a fitting one for Lucifer well before he fell from grace. We read, How you are cut down to the ground. Wow! What a difference! The position of this being, which was once so lofty, once so brilliant, and once so brilliant has been reduced to the ground. We read, For you have said in your heart, God reveals to us the factors that led to the downfall. We read, I will. The vanity and selfish ambition are forcefully represented in five statements that begin with the phrase, I will. This is the core of a life that is focused on oneself and is fascinated with oneself. He says, I will be like the Most High. It is a strange paradox that the desire to be equal to God actually makes a being less like Him. This is because, in contrast, God Himself demonstrated humility by stepping down from His throne of glory to reveal Himself to humanity. Even though Satan has a strong desire to elevate himself, he will not achieve any form of exaltation. Presently, he may seem to be elevated in some sense, but this is just a fleeting moment in the grand scheme of things. Satan, along with all those who aspire to elevate themselves, will ultimately be humbled. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 expresses the true path to being exalted. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time. Jesus witnesses this fall. This text affirms the idea that Jesus existed before his human birth and that he was present in the judgment of Satan. It also provides insight into how the devil was sentenced to live on earth, which sets the stage for the conflict between angels. The text in question affirms not only the pre-existence of Jesus, it also provides valuable insight into how the devil was sentenced to earth which sets the stage for the angelic conflict that would later arise. In essence, this text sheds light on the interplay between the divine and the evil one and how it shapes the course of human history. Jesus spoke of Satan's fall from glorified to profane. Falling like lightning from heaven was as dramatic and sudden as a bolt of lightning from heaven. Did you know that every time the kingdom of Jesus is presented in truth and power, it is like another judgment upon Satan and all who share his rebellious spirit? Where the gospel is preached with divine power, Satan comes down from his throne in human hearts and human minds as rapidly as the lightning flash falls from heaven. And when we see his kingdom shaken, then, like Jesus, we rejoice in spirit. It's amazing to think that the preaching of the gospel can have a powerful impact on the spiritual realm. In remembering the fall of Satan, Jesus also warned them against pride. You see, if even someone as powerful and privileged as Satan could fall from grace, then surely anyone could. It's a reminder that in any important endeavor, we must be careful not to get too caught up. As the saying goes, pride comes before the fall. We read, Behold, I give you the authority. Because Satan had fallen and the disciples were messengers of Jesus and his kingdom, they enjoyed the superior power of God over Satan. Did you know that by choosing to live in the risen Christ, you become a partaker of his empire? And not just that, but you also get to enjoy all the sweet fruits of his victory over Satan. It's like being on the winning team and having access to all the rewards that come with it. So, what are you waiting for? Join the winning team today. According to Job chapter 1, verse 12, 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 21, and Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1, Satan still has access to heaven, yet the triumph of the disciples over the demonic spirits was a significant event that confirmed Satan's downfall from his position of authority and power. Although he still possessed a considerable amount of power, his position was now inferior compared to what it used to be. 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 21. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. 
Temptation and Deception Temptation and deception are powerful tools used by the forces of darkness to lead people away from God and into sin. The Bible provides us with insights into the nature of temptation and deception, as well as strategies for overcoming them. Temptation is the enticement to sin, often disguised as something appealing or desirable. It is a tactic used by Satan to lead people astray from God's will. James chapter 1 verses 14 through 15 explains the process of temptation. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. This passage highlights the progression of temptation, starting with an internal desire that is then exploited by external enticements. Deception is another tactic used by the enemy to lead people astray. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 warns, and no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. This verse emphasizes the deceptive nature of Satan, who disguises himself as something good and appealing in order to deceive people. One of the most famous accounts of temptation in the Bible is the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, Satan tempts Jesus three times, each time trying to get him to sin. Jesus resists each temptation by quoting scripture, demonstrating the power of God's word in overcoming temptation. The story of Eve in the Garden of Eden is another example of temptation and deception. Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 describes how Eve was tempted by the serpent to eat the forbidden fruit, leading to the fall of humanity. The story illustrates the devastating consequences of giving in to temptation and the importance of being vigilant against deception. Despite the power of temptation and deception, the Bible offers strategies for overcoming them. James chapter 4 verse 7 provides a clear directive. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This verse emphasizes the importance of submitting to God's authority and resisting the temptations of the evil one. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 offers encouragement. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. This verse reminds us that God is faithful and will always provide a way out of temptation for those who seek Him. The Role of Michael Michael is a prominent figure in the Bible, often depicted as a powerful archangel who serves as a defender and protector of God's people. His name means, Who is like God? and reflects his role as a warrior in the spiritual realm. Said, the Lord rebuke you. This passage illustrates Michael's authority and power, as well as his respect for God's judgment. Michael is also associated with spiritual warfare and the defeat of evil forces. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 8 describes a great war in heaven, with Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, Satan and his angels. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. This passage highlights Michael's role in the defeat of Satan and his forces. Defender of the Faithful Michael, often recognized as the archangel and defender of the faithful, plays a significant role in biblical narratives. His name, which means, Who is like God, reflects his devotion and allegiance to the Almighty. Throughout the Bible, Michael is depicted as a powerful and righteous figure, engaged in spiritual warfare and protecting God's people. The significance of Michael extends beyond his role in battles and protection. He is also seen as a symbol of righteousness and obedience to God. In the face of spiritual challenges and temptations, Michael exemplifies unwavering faith and loyalty to the divine will. Throughout Scripture, Michael is portrayed as a powerful and righteous leader, leading the heavenly armies in battle against the forces of evil. One of the key passages that highlight Michael's role as the leader of the heavenly armies is found in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Michael's leadership is also evident in his interactions with earthly rulers and kingdoms. The Outcome of the War One of the most profound statements regarding the outcome of this spiritual war is found in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10 which describes the final defeat of Satan and the devil who deceived them. 
was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. This verse illustrates the ultimate defeat of evil and the complete triumph of God's righteousness. Another passage that speaks to the victory of Christ is found in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. This verse highlights how Jesus, through his death and resurrection, disarmed the powers of darkness and triumphed over them, securing victory for all who believe in him. The victory of Christ also ensures victory for believers. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57 declares, But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This verse emphasizes that our victory over sin and death is not achieved through our own efforts, but through the work of Christ on the cross. As believers, we are called to live in the reality of this victory. Romans chapter 8, verse 37 reminds us, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. This verse encourages us to live in the confidence of Christ's victory, knowing that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Victory of good over evil. In Genesis, we encounter the first hint of the victory of good over evil in the promise of a Redeemer who would crush the serpent's head. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 foreshadows the ultimate defeat of evil through the offspring of the woman. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. This promise sets the stage for the unfolding drama of redemption that will culminate in the victory of Christ. The prophets of the Old Testament also spoke of a future victory of good over evil, where righteousness would reign and peace would prevail. Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 through 7 prophesizes about the coming Messiah, whose government will bring about eternal peace and justice. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. In the New Testament, the victory of good over evil is fully realized in the person of Jesus Christ. Through his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus defeated sin, death, and the powers of darkness. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus reassures his disciples of this victory. I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. The continuing conflict on earth. The Bible teaches that the conflict between good and evil, which began with the rebellion of Satan and his angels in heaven, continues on earth. This ongoing spiritual warfare is a reality that believers must face, but the Bible provides guidance and encouragement for navigating this battle. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 describes the nature of this conflict. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This verse emphasizes that the true battle is spiritual, involving unseen forces of evil that seek to oppose God's purpose and harm His people. One of the key tactics of the enemy in the spiritual warfare is deception. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 warns, And no wonder... For Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. This verse highlights the deceptive nature of the enemy, who seeks to deceive people and lead them away from the truth of God's word. In response to this ongoing conflict, believers are called to be vigilant and to put on the full armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 17 provides a description of this armor, which includes the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. By putting on this armor, believers can stand firm against the schemes of the enemy and continue to proclaim the truth of the gospel. Another important aspect of the believer's role in the continuing conflict on earth is prayer. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 encourages believers to pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Prayer is a powerful weapon in spiritual warfare, allowing believers to seek God's protection, guidance, and strength in the midst of the battle. To 
Despite the challenges of spiritual warfare, believers can take comfort in the promise of victory through Christ. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 declares, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. This verse reminds believers that they are not alone in the battle, but that God is with them, empowering them to overcome the forces of evil. Influence of Evil in the World The Bible teaches that evil has a pervasive influence in the world, affecting individuals, societies, and nations. This influence is often manifested through sin, temptation, and the actions of those who reject God's will. However, the Bible also offers hope and assurance to believers, emphasizing that God's power is greater than the influence of evil. One of the key passages that addresses the influence of evil in the world is found in 1 John 5, verse 19, which says, We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. This verse highlights the reality that evil has a grip on the world, leading people away from God and promoting sin and disobedience. Despite the influence of evil in the world, the Bible assures believers that God is greater than evil and that He has overcome the world. John chapter 16, verse 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This verse offers comfort and hope to believers, reminding them that they can have peace in the midst of a troubled world because of Christ's victory over evil. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, believers are warned to be vigilant against the schemes of the devil who seeks to deceive and destroy. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. This verse emphasizes the importance of spiritual discernment and resistance to the influence of evil. Despite the pervasive influence of evil in the world, the Bible offers hope and assurance to believers. Romans chapter 8 verses 37 through 39 declares, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This passage emphasizes that nothing can separate believers from the love of God, and that through Christ they have the power to overcome the influence of evil in the world. Hope for Redemption in the midst of a broken and fallen world, the Bible offers a message of hope for redemption and restoration. This hope is rooted in the promise of God's love and grace, which offers a path to forgiveness, healing, and reconciliation. One of the key passages that speaks to this hope is found in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 through 19, where God promises to make a way for His people, even in the midst of their sins and failures. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. This verse emphasizes God's ability to bring about newness and restoration, even in the most desolate of circumstances. Another passage that speaks to the hope for redemption is found in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, which says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. This verse highlights the idea that the trials and tribulations of this present life are temporary and pale in comparison to the glory and redemption that await believers in the future. The ultimate expression of hope for redemption is found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Through His death and resurrection, Jesus provided a way for humanity to be reconciled to God and experience true redemption. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 declares, But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This verse underscores the depth of God's love and His willingness to sacrifice His Son for the redemption of humanity. In addition to the hope for personal redemption, the Bible also speaks to the hope for the redemption of all creation. Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 21 says, For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. This passage emphasizes that God's redemptive plan extends beyond individual salvation to the restoration of all creation. 
The hope for redemption is not merely a future promise, but a present reality that believers can experience in their lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. This verse highlights the transformative power of redemption, which brings about a new life and a new identity in Christ. The final battle. The battle is described in vivid detail in the book of Revelation, where the forces of good and evil clash in a final showdown that leads to the establishment of God's kingdom and the judgment of all creation. Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 through 16 provides a dramatic portrayal of the final battle, depicting the triumphant return of Jesus Christ as the conquering king. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This passage portrays Jesus as the victorious warrior who will judge the nations and establish his kingdom on earth. The final battle serves as a reminder of the sovereignty of God and his ultimate authority over all creation. Psalm chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 declares, Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The king of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. This passage emphasizes that no power or authority can stand against the sovereignty of God and that he will ultimately triumph over all his enemies. Lessons and Reflections The Bible is a rich source of wisdom and guidance, offering valuable lessons and reflections for believers. These lessons are timeless and relevant, providing insight into how we can live according to God's will and purpose. Trust in the Lord. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6 advises, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your path straight. This verse reminds us of the importance of trusting in God's plan and seeking His guidance in all aspects of our lives. Seek wisdom. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6 tells us, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. This verse highlights the importance of seeking wisdom from God rather than relying on our own understanding. Practice forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 encourages us to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ forgave you. This verse reminds us of the importance of forgiveness in our relationships, reflecting the forgiveness we have received from God. Be grateful. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18 instructs us to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This verse reminds us to cultivate an attitude of gratitude, even in the midst of challenges. Serve others. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 reminds us, serve one another humbly in love. This verse emphasizes the importance of serving others with humility and love, following the example of Christ. Trust in God's timing. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 tells us, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. This verse reminds us to trust in God's timing, knowing that He has a purpose and plan for every season of our lives. Walk in love. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2 encourages us to walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This verse reminds us to live a life characterized by love, following the example of Christ. Seek God's kingdom first. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 instructs us, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. This verse reminds us to prioritize our relationship with God above all else, trusting that He will provide for our needs. Understanding Spiritual Warfare Spiritual warfare is a concept found throughout the Bible, 
describing the ongoing battle between the forces of good and evil. This battle is not physical but spiritual, involving the conflict between God and his angels against Satan and his demonic forces. Understanding spiritual warfare is essential for believers, as it helps us recognize the nature of the battle and equip ourselves with the spiritual armor necessary for victory. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 provides a foundational understanding of spiritual warfare. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This verse highlights that the true enemy is not human, but spiritual, and that the battle is fought on a spiritual level. One of the key aspects of spiritual warfare is the importance of putting on the full armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 17 describes this armor, which includes the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This armor is essential for believers to withstand the attacks of the enemy and stand firm in their faith. Another important aspect of spiritual warfare is the power of prayer. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 encourages believers to pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Prayer is a powerful weapon in spiritual warfare, enabling believers to seek God's protection, guidance, and strength in the midst of battle. It is also important to recognize that victory in spiritual warfare is ultimately achieved through the power of Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 declares, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. This verse reminds us that as believers, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, empowering us to overcome the forces of evil, strengthening faith and resisting evil. In the face of spiritual warfare and the challenges of life, strengthening faith and resisting evil are essential aspects of the Christian walk. The Bible offers guidance and encouragement on how to strengthen our faith and resist the influence of evil in our lives. Developing a Strong Prayer Life James chapter 5, verse 16 encourages us to confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Regular prayer strengthens our relationship with God and helps us resist temptation and evil influences. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-4 through 4 further elaborates on the nature of spiritual warfare. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. This passage highlights the importance of relying on God's power and spiritual weapons to defeat the enemy. One of the key aspects of spiritual warfare is the importance of prayer. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 urges believers to pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Prayer is a powerful weapon in the spiritual battle, enabling believers to call upon God's strength and guidance in times of need. James chapter 4, verse 7 provides a clear directive for engaging in spiritual warfare. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. This verse emphasizes the importance of submitting to God's authority and resisting the temptations of the evil one. The Bible assures us of the victory of good over evil. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 declares, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. This verse reminds us that through our faith in God, we can overcome the forces of evil and experience victory in spiritual warfare. The Participants in the War The Bible portrays the conflict between good and evil as a battle between the forces of light and darkness, with angels playing a crucial role in this spiritual warfare. The participants in this war are divided into two camps, angels of light who serve God and fight for righteousness, and angels of darkness who follow Satan and promote evil. Angels of light are depicted as powerful beings who serve as messengers of God and warriors in his army. Psalm chapter 91 verses 11 through 12 says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. 
This verse highlights the protective role of angels in guarding and guiding God's people. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather in your presence today, we come with hearts open and minds eager to seek understanding from your word. We acknowledge your sovereignty over all creation and recognize the Bible as your divine revelation to humanity, a guidebook for our lives. Lord, we humbly ask for your guidance as we delve into the pages of Scripture. Grant us the wisdom to comprehend its teachings and the humility to apply them to our lives. Help us to approach your word with reverence, recognizing its authority and truth. We pray for clarity in our understanding, knowing that your word is meant to be accessible to all who seek it. May your Holy Spirit illuminate the passages we read, revealing your truths in a way that speaks directly to our hearts and minds. Forgive us, Lord, for the times we have misinterpreted or misunderstood your word. Help us to set aside our preconceptions and biases, allowing your truth to penetrate our souls with hindrance. Give us discernment, Lord, to distinguish between your timeless truths and the cultural context in which they were written. Help us to apply the principles of your word to our lives today, recognizing that while the world may change, your word remains constant. Grant us a hunger and thirst for your word, Lord, that we may continually seek to grow in our understanding and knowledge of you. May we approach the Bible not as a mere book of rules or stories, but as a living testament to your love, grace, and redemption. We pray for unity among your people as we study your word together. Help us to listen to one another with open hearts and minds, recognizing that each of us brings unique insights and perspectives to the table. May our discussions be marked by love, grace, and a shared commitment to truth. Lord, we lift up those who have yet to encounter your word or who struggle to understand its message. Open the hearts and minds to receive your truth and bring people into their lives who can help guide them on their journey of faith. We also pray for those who are persecuted for their faith around the world. Strengthen them with your presence and your word, Lord, and remind them that they are not alone. May your word be a source of comfort, strength, and hope in the midst of their trials. Finally, Lord, we thank you for the precious gift of your word. May we never take it for granted, but treasure it always as a priceless treasure. May it be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, guiding us each step of the way as we seek to live lives that honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. However, many ask, can Satan and his fallen angels be forgiven? To find out, click here.